How did you end up in Jamaica from Hartford, Connecticut, you said? Yes. Uh, I'll try to give you the, the short version because I can really tell long stories. <laughs> the short version is that I went to college in Hartford and I discovered The Harder They Come because it was a foreign film at the movie theater. It's 1973. <laughs> yeah. And then it was a short step from that to discovering that there were lots of Jamaicans in Hartford they had their own record stores <coughs> yeah. where you could buy reggae records. I started going to the record stores. One of the guys running the record store knew a band that needed a guitar player. I started playing with the band. Horace heard me and asked me to record with him on In the Light, which has just been reissued by VP, one of their reissue labels, earlier this year. Real quick, how did you link up with Horace Andy? Uh, he came to a rehearsal. I guess somebody said, I, I think he was looking to use the whole band, but he decided that I was the only one he wanted to use. Yeah. What were you playing prior to reggae? Uh, rock. So rock. what was the transition like? Oh, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I also have a classical music background and some, some jazz background, but at that point it was prime, guitar-wise it was rock, yeah, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. It was very different in the sense that with reggae, the guitar isn't really the lead instrument or the most important instrument in the band like it is in a lot of rock bands. So also the tones are different. The way everybody thinks about the music is different. It was basically everything I knew was wrong. That's the best way to describe it. or so uh, I was decided I was gonna to move to New York and I went to Ireland and Ireland to look for work and Ireland was run the reggae section was run by Lister Hugh and Lowe at that time uh -huh. and I knew him from encountering him with Horace and he said can you find Horace I want to do a record with him on my own label yeah and I said sure he's in Hartford I'll go get him so I got him we went down and saw um, saw Lister and the end result was Horace said, I'm going to Jamaica to make a record, why don't you come? Yeah. There's lots of work, the girls will love you. I said, that sounds great. <laughs> so I went down to Jamaica and of course it was the middle of 1980, it was the election. So what was that like? Uh, people getting shot every day, it was terrifying. <laughs> I, I got off the plane, we took a taxi to Crossroads and I saw some guys jump out of the car and start shooting. All right, I'll hang on. And yeah. then I got to halfway tree and I saw one Higgler cut up another Higgler with a beer bottle. And then I got to Tough Gong and Malcolm, the old time drummer, said, you've come here to steal our music and make a million dollars from it. So that was my first day in Kingston. And then I went, I had a, I was staying with Freddie McKay in Antrim Town. No, Antrim Crescent. The great Freddie McKay. Yeah, the same. So you have a real, <laughs> I have a real <clears throat> history going on. All right. So uh, Freddie, Freddie and Horace were very good friends. And Freddie's family had a house in Vineyard Town, which is right next to McGregor Gully. So my first night in Kingston, I'm hearing the you know the gunships go over, and the mosquitoes are coming in and eating me alive because they've never tasted anything like me before. And I hear the gunshots and police helicopters, and I go, "What have I gotten into?" Yeah. So uh, eventually, after three weeks, Horace went back because he just had no idea; he couldn't deal with it. Yeah. And. The day he was supposed to go back, Freddie McKay um, and I, I know, I guess it was the weekend, we were there at the Carib Theater to see an Independence Day show. Yeah. And Junjo was there and he was backstage and he saw me and said, what's he doing here? And Freddie and Horace said, he's a really good guitar player. Yeah. They said, bring him to the studio. Yeah. So I went to the studio on Monday, 
course, went back to America. I stayed there and did a couple of songs with Roots Radix, and Junjo liked me. Quick so question he, now, yeah. right? How was your experience with Junjo Laws and the Roots Radix? Was that an intimidating experience? Because Junjo Laws is a certain character, and Roots Radix is like the band at the time, you know? Junjo, I can only speak about what I knew with Junjo. Out of all the producers I worked for in my life, he's in my top five favorites. Yeah. He was always cool with me. He liked me. He hired me regularly. Yeah. He was. Uh, he always paid on time. He paid the second the session was done. He cared about the musicians. He cared about the artists. I mean, I don't know what happened out with the records after they left the studio, except they were popular. Hold on. You were doing studio work with Roots Radix? Sure. I'm on Gunman, the Michael Prophet tune. I'm on uh, Firehouse Rock, the Wailing Souls tune. I'm on a Johnny Osborne album called Never Stop Fighting. I'm on the Michael Pro Prophet album has the same name, Gunman. Uh, there are some other ones too. So you and Dwight Pickney were playing guitar or you guys will alternate depending on the song? Uh, Dwight wasn't full time with them. Yeah. At that time it was a guy named Sowell who used to play with Jimmy Cliff. All right. And he's a very underappreciated figure. He played in that. He played rhythm in that great band that Jimmy had, where Ernest Franklin played lead. Uh -huh. But he was a fine lead player himself. Yeah. What's and his whole name, so we know? Sowell Bailey, I think his last name was. All but right. the, a lot of people call him Sowell Radix. <laughs> yeah. He was one of the guitar players. Bingy Bunny, of course, was the other guitar player. And Bo P and Dwight would switch in and out depending on who was around. Dwight was still as that pow at that point. Yeah. It was really at the beginning of '81 that he kind of started going with Roots Radix full time. All right, I have a question now, right? With those big hits like Gunmen and all that, you guys built the rhythm. Like, how did it work in regards to building the song? That's what okay, I would like that, to know. a wonderful question. The way it worked was like this. The singer would walk in. In the case of Johnny Osborne, he played some guitar, so he would have the basic chords worked out. But probably 95% of them just came in and started singing the tune. Gladdy or Winston Wright or Robbie Lynn or Sterling or one of the keyboard players would find the key and start improvising a harmony, like a basic chord structure. And Flaba would, or who, if, it, it all worked the same no matter who the band was, but Radix, you know, I can speak about that because that was the one I started with. And they would, the singer would come in and start singing. We'd find the key. Gladdy and or Winston would find the chords. Usually in those days it was Gladdy playing piano and Winston would play organ. And then we'd sort of go through the tune and see if there was a bridge or any trouble spots or try different chord chords. The decisions were made really, really quickly. <laughs> and amazingly quickly. By the time we were through the harmonies, Flabba had a good idea of what he was going to play. Yeah. And I would either double his line or find find an independent part that that fit with him but didn't double. And this by this time, Style and and, and Sticky or uh, Sky Juice would have had the drum and percussion parts worked out. And generally, within 10 to 15 minutes after hearing the song for the first time, we were ready to do a take. Was it true you guys were knocking out albums in a day? Pardon? Was it true you guys were recording in albums in one day? Oh, sure. I did one in two and a half hours. <laughs> I mean, like, the, create the music and record the song. But we didn't, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the singer didn't necessarily voice. Yeah. And if they put horns on or something, that happened later, and they didn't mix it then. Yeah. But the actual rhythm tracks were cut generally, I'd say, between, we did between two and four an hour. Yeah. If it took longer than half an hour, something was wrong, and somebody would start browsing. Who was mixing during the time? Was Scientix mixing uh, Ginger Law stuff? Uh, he Okay, here's the thing with that. When I was doing it, the guys were Solji, Bunny Tom Tom, and another guy named Maxi that doesn't get a lot of notoriety, but he was definitely one of the guys. Yeah, hello. Um, Scientists came <clears throat> in a little later as a tracking engineer. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. But he was doing things at Tubby's. He was Tubby's protege. Yeah. Uh, we were recording on four track. You know, the bass is on one track, drums and percussion on another track, all the other instruments on the third track, and the singer or DJ on the fourth track. Yeah. Now, what's, what they would do with the tapes very often is go to Tubby's and voice and mix. 
because Tubby's, I think, was cheaper than Channel One. <laughs> I don't really know. I wasn't involved in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I played, I got paid, and I hit the streets the next day hoping something else would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Moving on to live performances now, right? When did you make the transition from you? When did you make the transition from studio musician to getting consistent on stage work? Okay, that happened about six months after I got there. Uh, what happened was I started. Um, Bo P was really the link. He lo guitar he used to, player. Yes, right. he played with Lloyd, Par Lloyd Parks at that time, right. and he was the only guitar player. And he'd been after Lloyd for a long time to hire a second player because yeah. a lot of the songs had two guitar parts, and. I ran into Lloyd at Channel One with Roots Radix, uh, but he also played live with We The People, which was the top backing band at that time. <clears throat> so Lloyd Parks was playing the bass on Channel, Channel no, One? Studio no, sessions? Not, not when I oh, was Oh, he was just there. hanging out? No, no, they, it, was kind of, it was kind of, Lloyd did most of his stuff at Joe Gibbs. They, he, they were like Joe Gibbs and the Professionals. That yeah. was basically We The People, with Sly coming in sometimes or Mikey Boo. All right. And Channel One was more Roots Radix. Of course, we all played everywhere, but by and large, Roots Channel One and Roots Radix was where that was. Why did Channel One have that sound? How were they able to get that sound they in had, that studio? They, they had a couple things. They, they had an API board. They had the same board at, at Hendrix had at Electric Ladyland, right. and they had these wonderful Altec speakers. I think they were with a blue horn in the middle of them. They used yeah. to blow up every three weeks, yeah. <laughs> and. When they opened the studio, they hired Sly and Robbie to come in and just play bass and drums, I think, for a whole weekend. And they moved mics around and tried all kinds of things. And Sly and Robbie were very eager to help because they'd never felt they'd been recorded properly. <laughs> so they came in and worked with uh, Jojo and Ernest, the Hook Him brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ernest originally was the engineer. All and right. he didn't know anything about engineering. He figured he'd start with bass and drums because they were the most important. Yeah. So he learned to engineer, and they all worked together to get the sound. Right. And once they got it, they didn't really change it much. Yeah. So that was the big, a big part of it. The room was great. That was another part of it. Yeah. My favorite studios have high ceilings, and Channel One had a high ceiling. Yeah. Harry J and Dynamic also had high ceilings. Right. Tough Gong had a much was much smaller. Yeah. Um, and it had, the other thing that made Channel One special was. The neighborhood was in the studio with you. All right. <clears throat> Channel One was kind of like Kingston 13's football team. Yeah. There wasn't that much else going on there. It was a pretty bad area. And everybody took real pride in the fact that Channel One. So vibes, but, vibes was in there. Well, the, what would happen would be if, if Zebby, the gatekeeper, knew you were from the neighborhood, you could come in and watch if you didn't make any trouble. Yeah. So very often you had 15, 20 people in the control room, sometimes in the studio, building spliffs, talking, whatever. And they knew if they talked while we were recording, they'd get thrown out. Yeah. So it was pretty wild, except when the, somebody said red light and then they all shut <coughs> up. But the genius of this was the people you were making the records for were actually in the studio with you while you were doing them. All right. That was the same kind of audience we were hoping would buy the record. Of yeah. course, you wanted more than that. but. If it didn't start in Jamaica, then it didn't, you know, that was really the, the foundation of it. And none of the other studios had that vibe to the same extent, yeah. having the people in the studio with you. Yeah. And I really liked it. It was very frightening at first. And then I realized these guys love music as much as I did. They just look scary. <clears throat> what was their reaction to you as a white person? I know some Jamaican, especially the Rastafarians, would be very prejudiced, you know? Um, the reaction was not at all what you would expect. Yeah. The guys who were the friendliest were the guitar players. All right. <laughs> you would figure an overseas guitar player coming in from anywhere and then being of a di different tribe. Yeah, yeah. You know, be being not Jamaican and, you know, uh, white or Caucasian, whatever you want to call it, uh, you would think that that would be an issue for everybody except one guitar player's name I won't mention. But the, um, the other ones were all very welcoming how do you do that how do rock guitar players get those sounds what what gear do you use how do you make guitars do this what pedals do you use you know we and i was going how do you guys play the play these great grooves how do you get these great clean sounds how do you think about music i it's, i don't understand so we were basically guitar geeking out uh you know dwight pinkney sent me to sub on a session for him three weeks after i met him 
to show you to show you how quickly it happened. You know, the guy gave me work. I just got there. He gave me work. So the guitar players were the most welcoming for whatever reason. Of course, that made it a lot easier. And the musicians in a whole as a whole were pretty cool because they had all toured. And got exposure. Yeah, and and they, and they had they had been way. overseas and and had, you know, had some idea of what was going on. And basically with musicians, if you can play, you're probably okay. Yeah. <laughs> they might not yeah, choose yeah. to socialize with you, yeah, but if yeah. you can play, fine. Yeah. And we did everything so fast that the worst thing you could do was slow up the process. Yeah. Like if you took a long time to find your part, yeah. that would have been a problem. Yeah. But fortunately I knew music and I knew my instrument when I went there. I didn't know reggae. I thought I did, but I didn't. The other thing that helped, interestingly enough, was my first or second session at Channel One, uh, Bingy Bunny was sitting next to me and he said, I played something while we were warming up. He said, Andy, how do you do that? I said, oh, you do this. And I showed him. And apparently that was something that a lot of the older musicians wouldn't do. They saw knowledge as something to keep secret. And when I came in from the outside and said, oh, this is how, this is what I'm doing, that, that apparently made a big difference. I didn't find that out for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love is never to say. I'm on the first album that Dennis did for a and the American Record Company. With uh, ba Why Baby Why and all those big no, hits? No, uh, it's on, the album is called Foul Play and I'm on the last two songs. All right then. <laughs> they left my name off, but I'm on the record. <laughs> all right, cool then. So, um, so at that point, Lloyd started becoming aware of me and by this time, other guys in the band were saying, you know, you should check this guy out, so on and so forth. And... Uh, but he hadn't heard me play for himself, and one day I was overdubbing on one of the Dennis songs, and he happened to be in the studio, and he yeah. watched me play, and I think, I think he liked what he heard. Yeah. And at the end of the year, I was about to go away with Culture, yeah. and he came up and said, "I want you to join the band." We the people. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I, "I'd already seen the band, so I was uh, very excited about the idea, and." So after, at the beginning of 81, I started playing with them. But what more can I do, yeah, to show you that I love you? That was when the, the, the train really started taking off. Yeah. Because we, we backed all the artists, so all the artists got to know me. Yeah. And a lot of the producers liked to go see the band for recreation. Uh -huh. So they saw me playing with them. And then six months later, we we did the first U.S. tour with Dennis Brown, yeah. and then that was a roller coaster for eight years, <laughs> and that was really uh, where all that started. Yeah, because once once I started playing with Lloyd, the session work accumulated, and the gigs accumulated because he was very busy. Yeah, yeah.